it's a wonderful journey and one that we're gonna we're gonna go on track by track right now so let's just dive in so we start right at the beginning uh, your debut single darts of pleasure uh, mm. and so this is your i mean this is you setting your stall out in every way isn't it so you, and presumably you were you were signed to domino when that came out yeah that that's the first thing we did with domino um it's funny because like like most of the songs that were on the first album we were already playing live at that time i remember having a discussion with bob uh, when we were choosing what we were going to do for the first single and what else would go on it and you kind of say like we're kind of damning these songs in a way because these are going to be the cool early stuff you know <laughs> like yeah every band has that you know they, they, they kind of like oh that's the stuff I like that stuff before they became you know yeah. more well known or whatever and uh, uh, yeah so that that was funny um, but it, it was exciting as well making that song and making that recording um I remember going into what was the name of that studio? It was like two kilohertz. Two kilohertz, it was like sort of northwest London somewhere, and it felt like a real occasion going into a proper studio. I would never been in one with a, a producer like that before either. It was it was a pretty cool experience, wasn't it? So, it was, yeah. so you got signed just on on homemade demos. Was it Lawrence who signed you? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, th there was a bunch of demos. I mean, we, we weren't even thinking of those demos, just recordings. We were kind of like recording for ourselves. And they were done in, in like my flat in Glasgow and a little bit in Nick's flat as well. And that's kind of how we thought we would record. It was, we thought it'd be very DIY. And then Lawrence was like, no, nah, get into a studio, get into a proper studio. But um, And he came, Lawrence came down to see us really early on as well. I think our second ever gig outside of Glasgow, uh, Lawrence ended up down there. Um, what was it called? Shoreditch Arts Centre? Uh, Shoreditch Arts Cafe, yeah. I think it's still there, actually. Mm. Uh, somewhere in Shoreditch. <laughs> it, would <make> sense. <laughs> it would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. 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 And, and I guess you, you never really lost that kind of... Uh, that rawness, you know. The, it's, you, 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 you didn't really become a super overproduced band. You always kind of stuff held on to that kind of gang of four angularity didn't Ooh, you i don't like that name being mentioned oh do you not that like because i hate it oh, do you hate uh, it, yeah. why is that um because i i felt we kind of like had our own ideas what we wanted to do the, the way we wanted to go then after our first album became successful there was a lot of retrospective influence imposed upon us like so like oh this band were massively influenced by gang of four and most of that came from Gang of Four themselves when they relaunched their career. So I've, I've, you know, I'm, I'm very open about the bands that were influential on us, and like that would be the Fire Engines, Orange Juice, Joseph K, the Monochrome Set. Those bands did have a big impact on us. Um, yeah, Gang of Four, a great band. Yeah, yeah, like like a really really good band, but it wasn't an influence on us. And, All right, and I, I guess. It just became this kind of like uh, at that period. I'm I'm kind of okay with it now, but at that period, like it was just this name that I kept on saying, and I, I became really resentful because I'm like, well, they weren't. You know, they just weren't an influence. And yeah, but yeah. take it as a compliment though. Oh well, I think yeah, I mean, all, all people are doing is saying it sounds a bit like Andy <laughs> right, Gill, right. and he was an amazing, amazing. Yeah, guitar of course player. he was. So, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a it's a huge compliment. Yeah, right, you know. Yeah, yeah. F forgive me. Forgive me for no, 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 that not up. at all, not at all, not at all. <laughs> so. Um, well, okay, so then, so the number two, so it all happened very quickly for you because then your second single was was the, the huge one that that Aye. even my girlfriend knows. <laughs> and, yeah, it went kind of mental that one. Yeah, we we, we weren't really because because Darts of Pleasure went to number forty four in the charts, and we were whoa, that's amazing! Like like there's an actual chart with our band name in it, and then Take Me Out kind of went. Crazy. Was it number two or number three? Number I three, I think, in the charts. Yeah. yeah. And we had no idea that a band we were in would ever go anything like that. And yeah, people were whistling it in the street. And yeah, it was nothing we ever expected. It was, uh, was kind of nuts. And not just people, but demigods too, because it was the <laughs> it was the it was the song that was so cool that Daft Punk remixed it for yes, free and right. then gave it to you and just yeah, said yeah. guys right we love this so much yeah, yeah we just did a we just did a mix we did a mix of it and like <laughs> i mean that must have made you feel that must have been surreal that was incredible they, they were a big influence on the band as well you know like, like we loved that sort of like french scene the french touch kind of scene and i i don't know i, I always felt that there was a similarity between what was hap what had happened with 
uh, with Daft Punk and what happened with us kind of in reverse because they kind of went from the dance scene, like the DJ scene, yet yeah, all the indie kids would dance to it. Yeah. And whereas we came from the kind of band scene but went very much into the club world as well. And a lot of our influences did come from the club world and the dynamics through which we built our songs, it was all built upon like things like just taking it down to the hi-hat or the kick drum. What we would hear in the, in the clubs and, and even the way that we played guitar, we were emulating like a mono synth being uh, sequenced you know that, that 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 if you listen to a song like michael that did it did it did it did it did it that that's how we were trying to play trying to play like like sequence synthesizers and so for those guys to come from that world and and remix us like that yeah it felt pretty exciting and, and where do you stand with that song now it would take me out yeah yeah it's it's a banger it's it's great it's great to play it live you yeah know? you still it's, it's funny because like and you know i do hear stories of like because often there are bands that will have like a, a song which explodes like that and sometimes bands can resent it like i've, I've heard stories that, that maybe radiohead don't like playing creep and that he, sort of thing he said it i mean the first time yeah. i saw radiohead he was like I'm not. I know you want me to play it, but I'm not going to play it because you know he he really resented it. He'd sort of yeah. grown to you know hate it for some reason. I've never felt like that about it because like it feels, it, it's a banger and it's really really <laughs> good fun. If I hated the songs or oh you know the other one I heard was was um what do you call it Stairway to Heaven. Now which one was it? Robert Plant. Robert Plant apparently hates Stairway to Heaven because he—I don't think he likes the lyric very much on it. Is that right? Yeah. Whereas I don't know. I, I, like Timmy, Out always feels great playing it. I, re <laughs> I, I really enjoy I it. Can, yeah. I, I can I can tell you that Guns and Roses hate. Um, well, Slash hates uh, Sweet Child of Mine. Oh, that's Absolutely interesting. Absolutely hates it. That's got that wicked guitar solo. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, but it was just. <laughs> wouldn't, you, wouldn't you look forward to that? You know? <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but he absolutely hates it because it was that's just started funny. off as a joke. What, what about Axel? Does he like playing it? Yeah, I think Axel likes it because the way that that happened was was. Um, so we're going way off topic here. <laughs> no, no. But, but well, this I'll is good. But it's kind of, <laughs> it is kind of on topic as well. Yeah. So the way that happened was because because Axel was notoriously late for everything. Right. Axel Rose, okay. Right? Yes, so, that's right. So, right, right. Um, so uh, the drummer and uh, uh, Slash were just dicking about at, at rehearsal, yeah. waiting for him to show up. Like interminable waiting for Godot, and and they started playing this. They started doing this piss take sort of circus riff, and they were just taking the piss. Right. And they do 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 do. It was just like they were just taking the piss, and then Axel walks in eventually. He goes. That's really good. Let's write a song, and they were like, "Come on, no, we're just dicking about here." Amazing. And and, yeah. and then he sort of made them write. You know, he wrote some lyrics, and so or, or didn't because that bit that goes, "Where do we go now?" Yeah, that's I'd heard that story. Yeah, because they literally didn't know what. Yeah, was yeah, going they were like, oh, like, "That's where do we so go good." Now? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, I never knew that. In rehearsal, going, oh, "Where do we go oh, that's now?" That's great. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Great. yeah. Yeah, there you go. So, um, yeah, no, but so uh, back to reeling it back to take me out. Right. You know who says that? A, who says that an indie band can't have two times the signatures in one song? <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> cat, hats off. It's like you know, we thought that was just tool only, but like, you know, wonderful. But yeah, I, I love those moments in songs generally, like like you know where things take you by surprise. You know like where where you think you're in, going in one direction, then yeah, end up in another world. I, I love that. Excellent, and you still get a buzz from playing it live, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Well, so do we, obviously. So uh, track three, and uh, in chronological order, we are at the dark of the matinee oh. now. So I mean, name checking Terry Wogan, never a bad <laughs> idea. Never a bad idea. Um, uh, you, I, you know, I, obviously, I. I was going to mention Andy Gill at this point, but I'm going to stay absolutely, <laughs> absolutely stone stone silent on Andy Gill at this yeah. point. So take me through the dark of the matinee, how that came to, to evolve. Well, that was kind of one of the earlier songs that we did in many ways, because before the band started properly as, as the lineup that made the records, it was me and Bob just talking about songs and talking about being in a band. And way back in, I guess, early 2001, we were talking about ideas for songs and we were sending things to each other via email and Bob had sent me some I ideas for this song, Dark of the Matinee. And then we were sort of like sending the, the lyrics back and forward and then sort of like writing melodies and things. So that was written probably about a year and a half or so before we kind of got together with the others. I, yeah, yeah I'm not, I, I think it was probably l late 2001. Oh, would it be? I late, think yeah. so, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, I remember being in the art school library uh, where I accessed my email at the time 
around that time. <laughs> what, was your, what was your email address at that time? It was now I'm the granddad at hotmail.com. <laughs> yeah. Not the, uh, what is it called? The two fish. Is it, uh, there was so so many weird. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. CompuServe. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. All those funny little companies that now yeah, disappeared. Mad as a fi- yeah. Mad yeah. As a fish. Oh, com. yes. I, I think I had a right? Mad as a fish. Dot com remember. email address. On me. <laughs> what happened yeah, to that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's not go off topic. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, do, uh, ev- everything covered on Dark of the Matinee that you want to talk about? Yeah. I, I, it, it, again, it's like a fun. And that's another one that changes time signature as well. Like the third verse goes into. 6 8 rather than 4 4. And ah. yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a lot of those songs kind of did that sort of thing. I remember our producer on the first album didn't like that song or Take Me Out. <laughs> like Tor Johansson. Like he said, Take Me Out was the one with the stupid riff. And <laughs> um, uh, how did you talk about Dark? Oh, yeah, Dark of the Madness sounds like stupid Jewish music. <laughs> Cause this, I think, is, this is Cardigan's producer, yeah, right? So, yes. oh, you know, he had yeah, a softer yeah, edge. Yeah. <laughs> softer edge yes. than you. Yeah, maybe, yeah. <laughs> But but having said that, like it was great working with Tor, and like like he gave the record a, a, a wonderful sound and uh, a cool guy as well, like a really good guy to work with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, that must have been. I mean, yeah, thrust in with a real, with a real pop. I guess a real a scando, somebody with a, an ear for a melody. I guess. Yeah. More than y- yeah. He really did, and he he really was coming from that kind of ABBA tradition as well. Like like. like ABBA were referenced so many times making that record. Technically, like like the way that ABBA, because if you listen to those ABBA records, they are recorded amazingly. And like he was talking about things like the the kind of tape compression that you get from having a sixteen track tape and all that sort of thing. Yeah, and it, it did have an impact on the sound. Uh, like yeah, he, and I, I do think those the, the, there's a really rich tradition in Scandinavia of uh, both kind of like dirty garage music and pop music as well and I think our band bridged both of those worlds as well and I think that's probably what uh, Tor found appealing about us as well God it's almost like all roads lead back to ABBA they are, <laughs> yes, they are responsible for so much like you know yeah. I'm really glad that you said that I, I had a, a lovely conversation with Paul uh, Paul Draper from Manson ah, and, right, and, yeah, I, and, yeah. I, and I was saying God I, lo- I, I think my favourite chord change of the, of the, of the 90s was, was Legacy by ah, Manson yeah, and he yeah. said Eddie I was just transposing ABBA ah I just, really he, he is just that right no just went, he said right, I just okay, he was yeah. very open about it he just said I just went through ABBA songs because they're just so brilliant and I yes. just I just wrote down the chords and I just thought oh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna literally gonna steal those chords and put yeah, them into yeah. you know I, they're, they're amazing chords like, like absolutely I, I remember seeing a documentary with, with Madness and Chaz not Chaz Smash was in Boston the, the keyboardist he said the same thing as well he was like, yeah, I can't remember which song it was he said like, yeah this is just a lift from ABBA as well <laughs> all roads lead to ABBA so we are now at uh, track four fourth single uh, and I uh, was Michael Oh, and, yeah. and you'd say, you know, testament to the depth of your songwriting. But of course, there was there was there was so much more. There were so many yeah. more singles that yeah. coming off that. But so um, I, for the first time, I when I f- heard this, I thought, oh, there's like there, there could there's almost like a Bowie lilt here of like the, the beautiful boys and right, boys yeah, on the yeah. dance floor and stuff. It, th- there was, you know, I mean it in a very complimentary way. I can't remember. <laughs> no, uh, right. I'm not going to be. A Bowie. I love Bowie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotta hate Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Of course, like, like he was amazing. I, I grew up with Bowie, and, and uh, yeah, absolutely. But you, you, yeah, you're right, actually, because like, the there weren't many sort of like pop stars that did have that proper kind of androgynous crossover and, and sexuality. But like way back then, like he was singing songs like "John, I'm Only Dancing" or "Boys Keep Swinging," and I guess that was part of our consciousness as a band as well. Like it's kind of who we are. And with that song, we were just literally singing about what had happened the night before. There'd been a night out and this thing had happened, so we wrote it the next wrote about it the next day. And not really thinking about it, just kinda of like, Oh, that's a good thing to put to write about in a song. And yeah, I, I guess people like Bowie having done that before made that seem yeah, just like the kind of thing you could write about. 
Well, I mean, he was really into sort of random lyrics and cutting stuff up and using, you know. Ah, yes, he took, he took the Burroughs thing, didn't he? The, the, yeah. the lyrical cut-ups. Yeah, yeah. 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 Which, but I, I love that. I, I, I love um, when you are writing song, songs, like trying to find any ways you can to like change your technique or challenge yourself so you don't stay in patterns. and like, like Because even when you play an instrument, if you pick up a guitar, your fingers do land in the kind of comfortable position. So it's always good to change things around and... Uh, uh, stop being predictable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always good to, to be out of your comfort zone. Yes. Uh, track five, we are at now. And uh, This Fire, when I, was that ever a single? Or is this just yes, a really... Yes, it was. It was. Yeah, yeah, This Fire was a single. Um, we re-recorded that um, with Rich Costi, who, who went on to produce the second album. Um, because we... We recorded the album with Tor in Sweden. Then we went off and did a little tour. And over the course of that tour, we finished this fire. And we popped into a studio in Glasgow to record it initially. And then went back with uh, um, Rich to, to record it uh, afterwards. So, yeah, it did become a single. It was kind of like the final single from that, that era, really, wasn't it, Bob? On the first album. I think yeah. That, yeah, I think that was the last single on that record. Yeah. Well, how many is that? Five. Or five. I think. That sounds about right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you had at least one. You had one, two. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. That's that's mm. that's single number five and track number five because we are in right. we are in chronological order. Yeah. Here. That's yeah. kind of nuts. Isn't I it? mean, yeah. that, that that is nuts. Yeah. Like you know. <laughs> well, originally we did discuss not putting darts of pleasure on the album. Yeah. Um, so that was a lot. That uh, we changed we changed our minds at some point, so it ended up on the. Yes, yeah. What, what do you think about that? Do you think we should have kept it off? Well, I think we should take it off. <laughs> let's, let's go back, like re-release the album. <laughs> bit late, bit yeah. late now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, how, how, Bob, how did this fire go for you, uh, uh, from your point of view? Yeah, I mean, uh, at the time, I mean, we caught it in LA, I think. Um, it was the middle of a tour. We'd been on the road for months by this point, and we, were re we re-recorded it in a studio in Los Angeles. And I don't remember a lot about the session. We were all kind of quite wiped out, but I do remember a manager arriving halfway through and we, we were kind of like sitting in the kind of the green room or whatever just like you know eating some sushi or whatever and, um, <laughs> and it's LA, LA, it's LA, it? LA and, yeah. um, and just absolutely exhausted our manager come in and go oh well done boys you've sold a million records and we're like wow really okay it's like yeah that's pretty surreal in America or just combined don't know I can't did, remember. So, yeah. did the Americans get you when you when you were, you know, igniting around the world? Did um, yeah, they did and they didn't. You know, like like they they really loved it and like, uh, yeah yeah, the songs were really popular, but I I don't think they could quite get their head around how how can I put it, maybe not kind of straight up heterosexual macho guy we were. You know that like, um, I remember reading. You know like um. On Amazon, you get these kind of like customer reviews, like like people review things. There was one that was forwarded to me by somebody uh, of like um, a, a guy in America, somewhere in the middle of America, who loved the album, but wrote this big review about how he had to uh, reburn the CD on his own CD without Michael on it because he was like, kind of, do you all really understand what the true nature of this song is? Do you know what he's actually singing about here? <laughs> and, and, and so, yeah. And, and so there was a little bit of that, like a little bit of uh, incomprehension of uh, <laughs> yeah, like these odd, effeminate British people coming yeah. over. We did, we did end up on some quite macho lineups on some radio festivals as well. Yeah, um, On that first record in the States. I remember once playing a radio festival between Papa Roach and Corn. Oh which is quite it's quite an odd fit for us you know yeah so that's, a, that's, that's a booking <laughs> error right there yeah <laughs> to have a word um, with your agent but there was there, <laughs> there were some guys in the audience there like a guy from our label was in the crowd and uh when we started playing michael he said he overheard two people in front of him and one guy turns to the other and said dude this song's about a dude. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that festival really well because all, all the the dressing rooms were identical, and I walked into our dressing room and like sort of like uh, with my head down, then looked up and said hello to everybody, and realised that it wasn't our band; it was Papa Roach. Oh, and, really? I was in, and they were lovely. They were yeah. they were really really nice guys. Like, oh, how's it going? Like, kind of like yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah, I remember Velvet Revolver. Their, their dressing room 
wasn't called a dressing room it's called the vibe room wow. <laughs> oh right very, wow. yes very yes. velvet revolver <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, but, yeah. but yeah rock you know rockers tend to be nice people in, yeah, in the no, uk 100%, like yeah, metal yes. you know metal heavy metal is yes. the sort of last vestige of Absolutely. the middle and upper classes yeah. <laughs> 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 and they all, yeah. all tend to be just nice posh lads you know it, it's funny though like i have this theory that like the more screwed up like the music is and the darker the lyrics and the heavier it is the more can like psychologically balanced the band members are like, like they tend to be very chilled out and like they've got everything well, out they get it out through the music well, you exactly know. yeah well yeah yeah i mean yeah uh, uh yeah i don't want to go down the whole chris cornell and you know and and right. and, and um you know chester bennington you know that they yeah they tend to be lovely guys who are in touch and you know use music as a catharsis and um oh yeah I, i'm i've been thinking about this a lot today we're off topic again but um yeah completely off topic uh i i shouldn't probably even say this but um i it's on my mind and uh four years ago to this day i was this is gonna not gonna be in this i was on the floor of that studio because i was mates with keith flint and it, today oh, was the oh, today, today, right. today was oh, geez, the day that, right. they, oh, that right. they found him it's like and i and i and i, I it, it was actually a really heartwarming thing because I, I i i couldn't finish my show i was too i was too upset because uh, I was the prodigy's DJ, uh, you know, uh, tour DJ, and, uh, and then uh, Kate Lawler finished my show. I then went on the next day, and I went on this l sort of lovely rant about being open and uh, about these kind of things that we're yeah. you know, talking about. And this guy texted in and said, "Dude, I was about to kill myself, and what you said about suicide wow. being a no permanent way. solution to a temporary problem has made me stop, and I'm going to get help now." So it was like, you know, one going saves another yes. one you know yeah, these, yeah, yeah. That, that's, sometimes, that's very yeah, powerful yeah, yeah man it's yeah. like you know what, what you do and what, yeah. what, 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 the, just the power the, of a microphone yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or, but you're totally music. right it, yeah. it, it, it does yeah. need to be talked about as well and and like men and particularly british men and british men in our world they do suppress it and they don't talk about it at all yeah. and and it, it's, it's as if you have to like put on this yeah the, the, this kind of like image of everything's fine everything's good yeah and so sometimes it isn't. well actually i i didn't mean to so we've now now arrived there and, I, and i'm now um, we're now chronologically at the end of your first album that's a hell of a thing for men to go through what was your kind of mental health like at, at, in that in that moment Look, because you'd exploded you must have been being rinsed by your label probably your management your agent <laughs> you know you know what they're like they, they work you yeah. for everything that yeah. you, and, and and sometimes don't think about you know what your state of mind is like what what, what, what where was your head in those days yeah we were pretty done in it was in some pr ways. pretty done in. it was the world had gone kind of crazy around us uh, it felt often felt like the only time anything was normal when it was just the four of us in a in a room like a dressing room close the door shut all that out and then it was kind of like a moment of peace and calm and i think i think one of the reasons we we went into the studio quite quickly after uh, the first touring the first record was because it was like a safe place to go <laughs> it would just be us it was yeah. like okay, let's go let's go in the studio and make a record and you know we get kind of like we'll get left alone a bit so that was that was that was a a factor involved in in us so quickly so quickly coming out with a second record so you could have toured it for the first one for longer but you decided oh, oh, they yes. wanted us yeah. to like like, like the american America, label yeah. they, they, they wanted us to um go and tour for at least another year yeah, we, with, we, with that first record we played the grammys in february 2005 um and i remember at the after show party someone from our american label coming up to us and say, uh, to me and saying this is great now we can really get to work on promoting this album <laughs> now, yeah, now we can really start <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. No, and that's what they wanted to do yeah. and it, it's funny because the the way the band felt like maybe not so much about my my own mental health or whatever that that's a different issue but like creatively it, it was a strange experience during that first year because obviously the band was going nuts and and we were getting invited to play all around the world and of course yeah there was an element of like being rinsed but also like it was like damn like you want mm. us to come and play in Tokyo you, uh, Buenos Aires uh, yeah. uh, you were like New York of course we're gonna do that you know especially if like me had been like 10 years slogging away in bands on the door or whatever and you couldn't could barely get a gig in Edinburgh you know like yeah, and, yeah. and so of course you, you're gonna do it. but as that became more and more intense I felt really frustrated creatively because I felt the band was totally on a roll. When, when we recorded that first album, it was like, oh yeah, we're really together. It's just firing and it's coming out so easily. 
And when we were on tour all the time, I just felt so frustrated. I just wanted to get back in the studio and back and record because it was good, you know. And, yeah, that's kind of an overwhelming sensation, like, looking back as, like, kind of how frustrated I was and how much I wanted to get back in the studio. And, well, that's what you did. And then your your lead single from album two dropped uh, to, to acclaim. I, I mean, I remember. Uh, so Do You Want To was your... Was your uh, was your uh, cheeky uh, <laughs> could have from from your cheeky cheekily named could have had it so much better? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and a hu- another huge hook. It, it it did come out as a banger. Like, I, I I remember writing the song um, quite distinctly. It was we, we, it was the last gig that we played of the tour of that album. Really, we we played at the SEC in Glasgow. And then after the gig, we went to a party uh, that was run by a place called the Transmission Gallery in Glasgow. And so it was a strange collision of worlds. Like there was the world that we'd come from, which is kind of like the music and art scene of Glasgow. I guess the kind of like the underground scene or whatever there. And then all of the world around the band at that time, like a, a big international touring band, all in one room partying together and sort of the songs kind of about the dissonance of those two worlds colliding together and how sort of incomprehensible it was but also observing it from a a slightly detached perspective which is kind of how we felt at that time you you know like like bob was talking about uh how the only place that felt seen was when it was the four of us together and often it felt like it was just we, the four of us were the only ones who were seeing around about us. It's like everybody else was going nuts and like we were the only people who could kind of really see how crazy they were all being and like how frothy in the mouth they could be. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I guess that song was sort of, in a way writing about where we were and how we were feeling. And w- what was the, pro- was the process of, you know, you say we, we go into the studio and it's a, it's, a, it's a safe place. Was it that old fashioned kind of like you've got so many weeks to go into a very expensive studio and make this record? Or were you, did you have the freedom of having your own studio and your own timetable and could you just uh, well, kind of relax a bit? We did want to sort of disappear from the world a little bit. So uh, we got a place about an hour's drive south of Glasgow or so and like set up our own studio with, uh, with Rich and uh, wrote and recorded down there, really. Um, I, I, I th- there were some time limits. Uh, initially, there weren't there weren't supposed to be time limits on, but then oh, things like our American agent had booked a tour and that sort of thing. So it's like, and then the American label saying, right, we have to get it completed by this time. So I remember towards the end, it did feel a bit stressful, like finishing it off for them. No, more towards it, like with them, because we finished it off in New York, went over to Avatar Studios in Manhattan to finish it off, and that did feel a little bit like we were up against the clock. I, I know my memories of that record were I, I loved the stage when we were in Scotland, um, because it was us kind of detached from the rest of the world. When it got to New York, the label was based in New York, because by this time we'd licensed to Epic Records uh, in the States. And man, those guys, they were from a different planet from us. Like, like I, I, I couldn't really, I, I, I felt like, I, I felt like I couldn't speak to them. Like, like yeah. almost like the vocabulary was different. They, yeah. they, I mean, it, it was, it, yeah, it was, it was quite Spinal Tap in many ways. Like, yeah. You know, everything you could imagine, every, every yeah. cliche you could Already imagine. Already Fafkin. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, w- one of the guys from the label we used to call Cricket Bat because he, <laughs> he was like, you know, do you remember the, the, the manager from Spinal Tap who carries the Cricket Bat then when asked, oh, it's merely affectation or whatever. And so, yeah. And, and, and they did seem like these absurd caricatures of music industry uh, types. And they were down the studio every bloody day. And it was a yeah. nightmare. Yeah. You, you say you love the, the, the Scotland part. Does does Scotland you know how a, a piece of art is affected by its surroundings? How does how does Scotland bleed into your into it, your it's true. Into your it, it, it's it's funny, we're very much a Glasgow band specifically within the context of Scotland, but 
I, I guess Audrey, you know, Aud- no, Audrey and Dino now in the, in the current lineup are, are the true Ouija's of the band. Uh, the rest of us were kind of drawn to Glasgow. I, I moved to Glasgow when I was 10. Uh, you, Bob, you moved to Glasgow. I was because 19. Yeah, it's got, I moved to go to the art school. For yeah. Us. I'm from West Yorkshire. But, um, right, yeah, because yeah, you don't sound like Glasgow Ouija's no. today. Uh, yeah. But yeah, the band, the band very much, ha- I, f- I feel, ha- is a Glasgow band. It's like we take the, the kind of DIY nature of the scene we came from was very, was, you know, that's, that's, that was hugely well you moved to, to Glasgow because of the music scene yeah, really, yeah, didn't yeah. You? I mean yeah the art, it's 50-50 it's like the art school because it was very great a uh, really great painting program but also I was a huge fan of like Bell and Sebastian and Mogwai the whole chemical underground scene the Delgados and yes Arab Strap and all that all those bands that were like huge to me um, so yeah m- moving to Glasgow is a bit of a no-brainer because it's, it's quite a small city relatively for uh, so you, yeah there's, there's not that many pubs and clubs so you would end up brushing shoulders with these musicians who were like you know heroes it's like you know you go to like Nice and Sleazy's and like Mogwai have got a table it's, it was <laughs> insane to me you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that wouldn't happen here Would, yeah. wouldn't happen in London would it that's really cool yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, so we come now to to track seven and on one that finds you smoother if i may say that and less <laughs> angular uh walk away yeah yeah i i remember i remember writing this one as well it was in the the dressing room of a gig in hamburg and yeah sometimes a song will just kind of pop out in a wanna so i guess it was written in 2004 when we were touring the first record and you're right it was a little bit different from the sound of the the other songs that we'd recorded up until that point but I, you know, I, I guess a test of a song is like when you play it live in front of an audience. And I, I remember the first time we, times we played that, it would have been before we recorded it. And uh, yeah, people responded to it well. And so I, I guess we knew that it fitted within the um, the context of who we were as a band. And that felt good. It felt that we didn't just have to stay within the restrictions of a specific sound or a specific kind of like energy level or, or beat. And uh, yeah, it did feel like expanding a little. It, it reminds me that you, you do have such a strong identity, don't you? Like even when you're experimenting a bit or softening the edges or doing whatever you're doing production wise or songwriting wise or whatever, it always sounds like Franz Ferdinand. Oh, that's it? good. I'm, I'm really glad you say that because that, that's really important for me because all my favourite artists are like that. You know, you know, we were talking about Bowie earlier. You know, if you, if you think of like how different, um, I don't know, we were talking about John, I'm only dancing, how different that sounds from anything on low, you know, but yeah. at the same time, it always sounds like Bowie as well. And, yeah. and I, I guess as an artist, that's what you really aspire to, to do, you know, like, like to, to go off in all these different directions, yet be instantly recognizable as yourself. Yeah, that's a, it's a nice place to be, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so we, we come to, oh, is there anything else you want to cover on Walk Away before we, before we move on? Uh, I'm, I'm fine with that. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we come now to uh, the one that sounds like a film title, The Fallen. Oh, right, yeah. And yeah. Uh, see, at that time, I was on, they'll edit this bit out, I was on XFM for 15 uh, years. <laughs> right, I was playing yeah. all your remixes. Uh, so yes. Because yeah, I did yeah, the yeah, remix yeah. show. Oh, that was right, my so thing. Th- th- was it the one, the Just East remix? Just East one, So yes. yeah, so Xavier yeah. and Gaspar, who yeah. were my buddies, did right, that amazing yes. mix of so The Fallen, good. didn't they? Yeah. I, I mean... It's one of my favourite yeah. remixes that's ever been done of us. Like, because th- there were a couple around about that time that that I really loved. There was the mix that those guys did of the Fallen, and there was also Errol Alkins' remix of Do You Want to as well. Yeah. And they were great. And I really did love. You know, we were talking about the crossover between the club scene and the the rock and roll scene, and th- it was it did feel very powerful at that time. And it, it, it's like it really felt like we were all living in each other's worlds and enjoying each other's company. Which which, which, which was great, but you're right. That that remix. What was it? The the fallen reanimated or something. No, they we, called we it. called it ruined by justice. Ru- yeah. Yeah. Yes, it was ruined, yes. <laughs> ruined by justice. <laughs> yes. And it was great because yeah. I know I was DJing all over the place, all over Europe, and and, and and festivals and clubs, and you know, and it was one of those tracks that kind of like you know indie dance, like just a totally you know yeah. it, was, it was a it, yeah. you're seeing indie kids and like you know ravers all go nuts to this filthy kind of yeah. weird remix but yeah. it, it's funny though because like, i guess if you look at somebody like justice for example like they are they wear their rock and roll influences on their sleeves of as course. well you know like like in in the same way that we wear our dance influences on our sleeves and, and like and, and embrace it and 
and I, I love that. You know, I, I, I like that sort of like a totally promiscuous attitude to your influences. You know, like like, like anything goes. I, I love that, and I felt like that around about that time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, you've got your your offbeat disco hi hat, <laughs> and they've got their Marshall stacks. You yeah, know, yeah, but, but yes, behind yeah, them, yeah, 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 totally. It, yeah, yeah, there's very on the sleeve. Yeah. Um, uh, and the the track itself, I mean, remix aside, the fallen. Um, how did that come into being? What do you want to do? You want to talk? Yeah, is there sure. Any memories or about that? Yeah, I, um, yeah, I remember playing it together for the first time, and again, like the the riff, kind of bringing it all together, and the, lyrically, it was about another night out in Glasgow. Uh, it was about our friend We Andy, who used to hang out about, about that time, and uh, him. Well, when the band started off. Uh, we were pals with Robert is his real name and we were playing our second gig and he was going to play with us and we were going to be his backing band and uh, we were all out in a night out together and uh, he really wanted a black eye he really wanted a black eye for the gig and he, and he kept on going around like asking everybody like can I like, you gonna, you gonna punch me in the face I really want a black eye for the gig <laughs> and uh yeah, eventually he came round to me and I, I hadn't hit anyone for like 20 years or something like that. <laughs> and um, I'd, I'd drunk about half a bottle of vodka and a bottle of champagne. So um, you were a bit fighty. I wasn't fighty, <laughs> but I got talked into it. And um, yeah, let's, let's just say the, 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 the rest of the song is about the catastrophe of a night that happened yeah. after, after I did. Yeah, yeah but it was, it was quite, I remember I was there and it was there was a lot of blood. Yeah. Um, but it was the uh, you you fainted. Yeah, because well, that was it. Well, well, yeah, well, and that's, well, when well, the, that's when the bouncers called an ambulance. Yeah, so yeah. the fall and is very literal. It was for you. Yeah, <laughs> you. No, 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 it wasn't. They, 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 they. So what happened was right. right so I, I I I punched him like, and he was wearing this suit with a like it was a white shirt and a white tie, and all the blood was running down the front of the suit. And I was like, oh man, like and like Robert, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm going to take you up. And I, I took him up to get the first aid bit. And I was kind of steaming, and uh, um, and and the first day of seeing that, then I looked at him, and I looked at all the blood, and and Bob's right, you know, I'm I'm a bit squeamish, and I fainted. I remember coming back round, and uh, the bouncers were standing over me, like slapping my face, going, "What have you taken? What have you taken?" I was like. I've not taken anything. I just had a wee bit to drink and I'm a bit squeamish. I'm going, no, you're not. What have you taken? There's an ambulance coming for him and there's some cops coming for you. <laughs> that was right. That's yeah. when you ran away. Yeah, that's what I... Yeah, because I remember seeing... Because it was at the art school in Glasgow. I remember seeing the bouncer, like, saying, like, like, oh, man, I was just thinking to myself, oh, I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. And uh, I said to him, look, I'm feeling like I'm going to faint again. Uh, I need a bit of fresh air. So he took me to the the front door at the top of the steps of the art school union and uh i remember looking about and my girlfriend at the time it was her degree show and uh she and all of her family and lecturers were all standing at the bottom of the stairs like totally appalled and really really disgusted and i was just standing at the top of the stairs with my arm and a half nelson with this bouncer and it's like oh man i gotta get out of here what am i gonna do i just kind of looked around we just stamped on the bouncer's foot and, le and legged it down that steep hill yeah so that's what the song's about <laughs> that's hilarious yeah. what yeah. have you taken what have you taken <laughs> yeah. we're in glasgow there's more alcoholics here than per square mile than anywhere else in the world we're in glasgow yeah. um okay so we come to uh to outsiders suddenly ah, a spooky yes. synth appears yeah right yes yeah and this song was never a single actually uh but it's always been a very big song live i guess it was it, it doesn't have the kind of structure that singles have it doesn't do the verse chorus middle eight kind of thing and it but it always really worked very well live and it seemed to sort of um just resonate with the audience everybody always kind of like sings the answering lines and i think it works kind of almost more like a piece of dance music it builds it's about the slow build like build to the crescendo and when we were talking about the songs that were going on the album we really felt this one had to go there because it always has been such a a big part of the live set and maybe even like lyrically it does kind of sum up about how we felt because even when we were in the heart of it when everything was going crazy we always did feel sort of outsiders crashing a party and, yeah and, yeah yeah and and i guess still kind of do and uh yeah it's it's kind of our theme song in some ways 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Outsiders is what is what you are. It, yeah, like, yeah. You know, and, it's, and I think that's that art. That's the art school thing, isn't it? It's it's you know, it's a fringe thing. You know. Yeah, it it, it always did, and and I, I I guess going back to the people that I admire, that you know, like like we were talking about um, uh, other bands earlier. But I, I think of something. Think of something like Smells Like Teen Spirit again. Like like you know, that definitely felt like the outsiders that suddenly ended up in the middle of the world as well. And yeah. Yeah, I always felt an affinity with that, that that kind of approach. I have to big up the bass line in, in that song as well. You can't go wrong with a bass line as disco as that, right? Yeah, it, it's, it, I'm always amazed by Bob's stamina with that song live because it, it does go it does on. extend sometimes. It can be 15 minutes long sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and like, you must have very powerful yeah. wrists if you keep that going. I think it's fingers. I think that's or is the, it the fingers? You're, you're, yeah. you're Bernard Edwardsing away there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 But yeah, it is good, and, and and the groove always feels good on that one. It has, it has well. become quite a, a big live song for us as well. We, we for many tours we would have extra drummers come up and join us on stage, especially at festivals or bands that were on tour with us. So yeah, there's been a lot of funny juxtapositions. Like one time we played Tea in the Park, and uh, Chad Smith from the Red Hot Chili Peppers came up and played uh, a floor tom during the song, <laughs> along with a bunch, a bunch of other musicians oh, as well. Yes. But uh, our friend Andy Knowles, who was touring with us at the time. It was his his role pre the shows at these festivals. He would like you know we'd round up some random drummers backstage, and he would walk them through it. And I thought, okay, so we'll come on, show them we'll, the we'll, do, we'll do it like this, and then we'll do that, and then we have a break, and then you do it, and you go back in again. And he was giving these instructions to Chad Smith, and he'd learned to play the drums from watching Chad Smith videos when he was a teenager. And then and then there he was, kind of like showing Chad Smith a drum part. Which Brilliant, was, underrated yeah. drummer, Chad Smith. He's amazing. Oh, yeah, he's a great incredible. drummer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're, they're amazing drummer. musicians. Those yeah, guys yeah. that they don't get to. Uh, you know, we don't take our hats off enough, I think. No, you're totally right. So now let's take stock because now we're at the end of album two and we're yeah. about to start album three. So so where were you at then? How were you feeling? Where where, where were your heads at? Just at the, in this, in in this, just be, be, so Still before, a, so yeah. after Outsiders, but before, before Lucid Dreams. So that would have been like towards the end of 2006, I guess, when we finished touring that album. Um, and I, I remember we did a tour around the States. Uh, it was like a double headline tour with uh, Death Cab for Cutie. And uh, the Cribs were opening up for us at that time. And we all got on really well together. And uh, I, I was chatting to the Cribs around then. And that's when they asked me to produce an album for them. And that felt like a really good thing to do. It felt like, ah, oh, you know, we've been kind of hard at it with the band for a wee while. To go and to like hang out with some different guys and do something different felt very appealing for us. I think all of us felt a bit like that at that time, didn't we, Bob? Like, like, yeah, you know. that was the first time uh, for many years, actually, since like mid-2003 that we that we weren't doing France Ferdinand every day. Yes. Um, yeah. So that was quite, and it would become a long way, you know, from mid-2003 to the end to September 2006, you know, two albums and toured the world yeah you know, more than once uh so yeah it was it was it was a bit of space i think yeah and then so we all kind of like did a bit of stuff like i did the cribs thing spent a bit of time in new york and then uh yeah we sort of got back to glasgow and started writing songs again and feeling around and this time we built up a, an, another studio in what had been the town hall in Govan, which was kind of like semi-empty at that point, wasn't it? And uh, yeah, so I put together another studio, and uh, yeah, it, it was good. Started right working the songs. I guess the next song would be, if I remember rightly, "Lucid Dreams." Yes, which was, I think, a teaser, wasn't it? Like a an, well, an MP3 yeah. te this, this, download the, teaser. Yeah, thing. this came out as a sort of single before the album, like maybe even before the album was finished. I think we'd finished recording this song and, and had maybe played it live a couple of times. And it felt good and we just thought, yeah, let's stick it out, you know? Mm -hmm. And again, this is another one that has always been like pretty key live. Like it's always been a, a, a really, do you remember we, we, we stopped playing it for a while and then we realized we should play it again. Now, when was that gig in Vancouver? Do you remember when the guy was uh, like... Yeah, it was. It would have been t 2017, maybe. 2017, right, yeah. We hadn't played it live for a wee while. And there was a guy down at the show, 
And like between every song, he was just like, going, "Lucid dreams, play <laughs> lucid dreams." Yeah. And like, and, and we were kind of like, "Oh, we haven't rehearsed that one. We can't really play it." And like, and just like every song was like, "Lucid, play lucid dreams." <laughs> and then and when when we'd finished and we'd done the encore, we'd gone off stage, and like the the guys were literally like sweeping at the plastic pint glasses and stuff. Like he was slamming the stage, going, "Play yeah, right. lucid <laughs> dreams." The house lights up. Yeah, just yeah, by yeah, himself. Yeah, in just, his <laughs> yeah and, and, and it was about that point where we, we, we kind of came back I thought maybe we should play Lucid Dreams again <laughs> yeah, 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 we, we rehearsed yeah. the next soundtrack I think yeah, the, man's, yeah, yeah. the man's got a point I mean it is a great riff yeah yeah, yeah the riff was really fun and I, I know that the Paul and I had been listening to like a, a lot of African Afrobeat music and yeah that probably had quite a lot of influence on the rhythm and I know we tried to go in a different direction with a lot of the songs on this record like with, with the rhythms like taking it away from I guess what had been what you called like the sort of like disco offbeat on the hi-hat sort of thing and go in some new directions yeah and it still is a great song to play live like like the energy is really good on this one well thanks to that Vancouver ride <laughs> it's my favourite song with a shipping forecast on it hey <laughs> I know right yes <laughs> yeah I wonder, if you, I wonder if in Vancouver you get the German bite reference yeah yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, the BBC gets yeah, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so now we are we now are at our at first single proper with right. with uh, Lucid Dreams being a being a teaser, and um, you and we come back to that even when you're experimenting, relatively speaking, you yeah. still sound really you. And that yes. this this would be my case in point. Like this would be oh, I, I rest yeah, my yeah. case, Your Honor. They <laughs> they always sound like 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 them. Um, so yeah, tell me about Ulysses. Yeah, because you're right. I guess like sonically, it's quite different. Like the the synthesizers come a little bit more to the fore. The rhythms quite different. Just even the sound, the yeah, the, the, the way I sing and stuff. Like we really felt like we were trying to do something new. And I, even in the song, I was thinking I found a new way. Damn, it was like like we were really looking to do something new. But it sounds very much like a Franz Ferdinand song and it's funny I, I remember talking to Julian when when he first joined the band uh, just about what his experience of us was and and he was saying that he remembered listening to Ulysses for the first time and like being really surprised by it and not expecting something like that to come from us and yeah that's good I guess we were trying to do that weren't we yeah yeah mm. Um, and but this one, I remember we worked with Dan Carey, uh, and working with Dan was great fun. Like, like so, we locked our way in the old town hall in Govan in Glasgow, and yeah, had a really good time making this record and experimenting with the sounds, and yeah, it was it was a good time, wasn't it? So you, I mean, you you're one of those are probably few bands that still, you seem to always have been in a good place when you were making your your records <laughs> Bob <laughs> yeah I, mean, yeah I think Alex maybe enjoyed the town hall experience more than I did oh, okay <laughs> tell, was, tell us more well it was we were it was like an abandoned corridor I guess uh, with very thin single glazing which had no sound insulation obviously so we had to block up all the windows uh, for soundproofing so basically we were in a windowless room um Okay, Which is yeah, most, a lot of studios are windless. It's fine, but it's also in the middle of the winter in Glasgow. So it's like you know you arrive in the dark and then leave in the dark. It was, it was uh, yeah, but you know I had yeah. The, it's a very night. Nice it's yeah. funny though because like like you know that whether you were in a dark place or not. Like I, I, I have sort of mixed feelings about talking about this because I think you do have to be open about your your mental state and where you are. Things equally, I'm so wary of mourning as an artist and particularly somebody who has the astonishing opportunities that we've had you know and like all of the those great moments like like we did tour around the world we did get to make all these records and i i i feel to like so like be in that context and so sort of say oh you know i was having a really tough time at that point and blah blah it's like Sharp morning, like who cares? You know, like like, and I I don't know, I I I I I still don't know how to get my head around it. Like like, whether I should like sort of say the truth about how you feel in in some of those moments in your life, or to just sort of say, yeah, stop mourning. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the right approach I, is. I, I, honesty is the best policy. I always find. Yeah, 
<laughs> and yeah. you know, I, I don't think it's, I think people, especially now, I think people are much more savvy and they can appreciate that, yeah, you go to Tokyo and wherever, Hungary or whatever, and, and, but you, you only, you get there and you have to do a sound check and then you have to do a gig and then you have to get on a plane, go somewhere else and you don't get to see the beautiful, you know, blossoms in, in, in Kyoto. <laughs> and, you know, it's, the it cherry be, blossoms out yeah. the Yono. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, of course. Like, like, so, so right from the beginning, the the word dark periods and and yeah, yeah. I, I think I think what happens is with touring when you first start the travel. No matter even if you're in Tokyo for twelve hours, it's still in bloody Tokyo. It's bloody really exciting, mm. you know. Um, as as you as you progress and you're like a decade in or whatever. I, for me personally, I found that it, whereas in the beginning it was like it was like oh, traveling i love traveling i love i love everything about it i love the shows and now it becomes more focused on the shows for now as a you know 20 years in now it's all about the gig uh for me i mean i still, I still love being in foreign cities and wandering around and we do actually get a bit of time in places nowadays you know yes um so um but it all becomes the the work is the actual sitting on a plane or sitting in a van and the the play the playing is just a joyful kind of gig bit and as i get older i savor that more and more you know Great, yeah, great. And, and also, the other thing I think is like, like the mental health of bands is really exacerbated by the uh, the culture of caning it. Yes, you know, like, like, of course, yeah, it's great to cane it sometimes, but yeah. like, like, you know, and uh, yeah, but also, but there's a, there's a there's a thing of when you start and you're you're playing your local scene and maybe you're playing a couple of gigs a month and you're getting paid with a block of beers and or like whatever. you know yeah. in, in, invariably like you know then it's like yeah we played a gig let's get smashed and then there's this kind of like you, this false idea that is that's what you do after a gig you got you know and so but if you're doing that if you're playing like five nights a week it's not you know it's um not it, it, it's yeah, yeah. also the, the other thing is like when you get a band together when you do gigs you're ex you're, you're escaping from the yeah. drudgery of everyday life like like the the repetition the routine and it's like right i'm gonna go crazy like we're having a gig we're, or even like we're gonna go away on tour for five days it's gonna be amazing we've got like five gigs it's gonna be so like, let's let's cane it every night and then suddenly you're going around the world doing that every night yeah and to maintain that level of caning it yeah <laughs> it's not good for your mental you health end up in a really bleak mm. place it's mentally it's my, yeah. I mean, skipping ahead a bit here but t t uh, touring Always Ascending I, I didn't drink for a couple of years doing that and that was my favourite tour of all time it's just been absolutely because that's that's when you really get to like experience every aspect of like you know like, I, I can remember each gig like vividly you know and like just like appreciating being there it's... lucid wakedness yeah, exactly yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. we have uh, track 12 now um way past the halfway point and we come to know you girls and we have a groove that you can land a jet on <laughs> and so many hooks and it's so sexy all Let's, right let, let, i mean i'm gonna go there and i'm gonna say it's a really really sexy song yeah. and i'm gonna and i'm gonna say this so i and it, and and this is i mean i'm a big huge sort of art rock fan and it's a massive music fan and i've spent a lot of time sort of thinking about this and and and, uh, and for longer because i i'm i'm older than you mm. and and uh i i think that you made art rock sexy because <laughs> because here's the thing if you look at right through art rock it's very sexless. Uh, uh, Roxy music, are pretty sexy. Okay. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. That's true. Every rule has its exception, and <laughs> yeah. and yes, Roxy music in the seventies were that exception. Yeah. You know, but you look at I don't know, Talking Heads or Radiohead or everything, everything more recently. Every, you know, you look at the art rock bands. It's a, it's quite an asexual genre to be in. So you bringing the sexiness <laughs> is something I think that we should doff our caps to. Oh, good. good. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's uh, it's funny because like that that song started off as a version of like, there was a, another song in the album called Catherine Kiss Me. And it was kind of roughly based upon the first kiss I ever did have. And that's the kind of root of the lyrics in that. And um Catherine is a real person, like she is a real girl, and so like both those songs are, are, are about that real girl and that real event. And it's funny, like after that album had been out for maybe about nine months or so, I got an email from Catherine, 
and uh, it's saying like, my mum thinks that you're singing about me on this record. <laughs> well spotted, is, mum. Is that true? And I was like, yes, <laughs> yes, it is true. Yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, that's kind of a bit funny. So yeah, I wonder how she feels about it now. Probably all right. Her mum, that is. Yeah, yeah how did the mum spot? How did the mum spot? What did what did she know? Like, yeah. <laughs> um, that's uh, that's actually quite heartwarming. Yeah. Um, and so we come to we come to now. So we're at end of album three now. So yeah. again, let's take stock, yeah. think back. How were you feeling then? End of what, album three. Yeah, what was happening in your life? What, how are you feeling? Ah, I remember that would have been about the time we went to Orkney together, Bob. Mm. <laughs> yeah, we had a little holiday. That sounds nice. <laughs> yes. Went to Orkney for a holiday. Well, it's, it's, it's funny, like, you know, because you can be very close to the people around about you, both, like, physically while being quite distant, you know, like, and I, I feel that, that Bob and I had been like that around that time. We weren't really talking much about then, were we? No, I mean, we yeah, we toured quite hard, I guess, and um, we, yeah, we played a lot of shows, and then we, after the tour had finished, we never really made plans as a band to say hey you know let's let's take a little holiday and then meet up and make music again we just yeah. kind of stopped <laughs> contacting each other yes um, in fact it was 10 years ago pretty much six, no 11 yeah, yeah it was because it was my um, 39th yeah, birthday yeah around about that sort of time mm. anyway so we we sort of said oh yeah we haven't spoken to a while and there's a lot we haven't spoken about we hadn't really comprehended what had happened to us yeah had a debrief yeah and so we agreed to meet on neutral territory like a place that neither of us had been before but quite fancied going yeah and like and after looking at the map we both said oh neither of us have been to orkney let's let's both go there and what a lovely idea it, it was really good actually you know we, we we spent hours just walking around this amazing beautiful rugged island just talking about everything talking about what had happened and we went to the viking what's that viking museum called oh um <laughs> scarabray Sca scarabray yeah, yeah like you, yeah i highly yeah. recommend yeah it's really good i was actually funnily enough thinking about orkney <laughs> for this summer and i and oh really I, yeah. I was thinking either one or the other end orkney or sillies oh right, oh, okay. right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. You're gonna it's get ridiculously it. expensive to get to silly island yeah well, I, I don't even know how you get August. there a helicopter from a two or three places i think yeah wow. okay well there you go oh you could fly to orkney from like Whatever. You get ferry, can't you? You, you can get ferry as well. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Orkney's cool. Yeah, I'd recommend it. <laughs> Excellent. So you, obviously, you, oh yeah, two two guys walking in a beautiful place. Yeah, That's a very nice. powerful thing, and like lots of yeah. nothing but nothing but good is going to come from that. And right? talking, talking yeah, a lot as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess we hadn't talked uh, that intensely since um, the very beginning, really, because we've been so no. busy. It's kind of like yes. something you don't really find yeah. time to do. So it was good. It was very worthwhile. We, so you could now attack album four with you know i guess more, uh, with an emotional clean slate a little bit yes it did feel like that and um and and coming into making album for like it really felt like oh no let's just just have some fun making this like, like let's really enjoy it and also like like with the people that we chose to work with on that one it's like kind of oh you know we don't have to go into a studio with one guy and like sort of like meet a particular date to do it so we ended up working with a few different people we worked did some songs with todd terrier and um a couple with uh uh joe goddard and alexis from hot chip some with mark ralph uh who else was it there was somebody else on that record too um, Bjorn Yitling. Oh yeah, Bjorn went back to Sweden again. Bjorn Bjorn Yitling from Peter Bjorn and John. Uh, oh yeah, and yeah, it was it was quite an eclectic record, really, both in sound and and the way we made it. So uh, we come to, so we are in album four proper now. Uh, right thought, right word, right thoughts, right word, right word, right action. This is Zoroastrian. <laughs> yes, I mean, and, and a bit of a tongue twister, it, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, yeah. but but more profoundly, it's the fundamental tenet of Zoroastrianism. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, good thoughts, good words, good deeds is what the and, Iranians say. And, and and also that attitude, and maybe the I, I don't know. It's I, I guess so much of what we were in a band and who we were was built not just upon instinct but also kind of like a, a degree of impulsiveness and the the way of thinking of right thoughts right words right action is maybe the opposite of that and it was maybe countering the negative aspects of that impulsiveness which had dictated who we were by kind of embracing those kind of three simple principles that yeah it was again very good for us you know 
So, uh, I'm, and I'm guessing that the, maybe the, your, your walk and trip to Orkney has had something to do with this. But you were again, you were in a really good place. At, at yeah, this time. yeah. I, I know that both Bob and I, and and I think Nick and Paul as well. I can't really speak on their behalf. Like had had been maybe searching for a, a degree of peace that we didn't have in our lives at that time. Like like and. Um, and yeah, and so maybe some of the, lyrically, some of the the songs were, were were reflecting that too, like searching for something or whatever. Yeah. So we come to Evil Eye. Ah. Now, <laughs> which so, isn't that at all. So, yeah, <laughs> but so so um, Evil Eye. It's, my mum's from Iran, and uh, ah, I, right, and, yeah. and so she's obsessed with the Evil Eye. Yes. And I'm guessing that you've got a, probably a Greek connection there. Exactly. To, yes. To, to yeah, that yeah. same thing, because we were. We're neighbours and exactly and w- yes. w- warring, warring neighbours. <laughs> yes. You know, yeah, thousands yeah, yeah. of years. So Battle of Salamis, that, all that. It's, it's, a, it's all long gone now. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's push past we can forget that. About <laughs> that. Yeah. So is is that what's going on here? Is this yeah. a, is this a Greek thing? I mean, of course. Like for for our ancestors, not just our ancestors. Like 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 today as well. It's such a huge part. And for me. It kind of came through my grandmother. My Greek grandmother was obsessed with the evil eye, and not just the evil eye. Like, like there were so many other sort of like elements of superstition and mysticism within her life. Like, uh, the Ace of Spades was the 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 harbinger of doom. And my my grandmother was a real gambler as well. I remember me and my brother like like terrible like evil little swords. Like when we were kids, staying in her flat in Piraeus, we found like all of her packs of cards that she used to gamble with. And we took all the aces of spades out and like we just hit them <laughs> round her flat. <laughs> And That's she, cruel. <laughs> and like, I just remember like hiding and like, like she found the one on top of the kettle and just said, this is terrible. Ah, you, I'm all, like, 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 like. And so, um, yeah, so the, she was obsessed with that and like, uh, and the evil eye. And it, if she felt anybody was casting the evil eye upon her, um, she would have to spit three times like like and yeah and so the, it was a bit, very big part of kind of like who I was and at the time when I was writing the song and I, I guess I absorbed it as well and like I, I, I did have these kind of like little superstitions like I still kind of have them as well like I can't go up steps one at a time I have to do it two at a time and it's I've got to end the steps on an even number otherwise <laughs> the rest of the day is going to be terrible I hear you man right okay, I yeah, really you. hear and, you and it's this. these things that dictate that and I remember at the time saying like well here I am like like logically like I, I'm a very logical atheist who's a, a rejected all of the ideas of organized religion yet I have all this superstitious kind of nonsense in my life as well and they like, so like like i'm a total hypocrite and so that that's kind of what this uh, what what's this, what the song's about and it's like it's like like it's like sitting in a cafe predicting the color of the next car because i can like mentally i've got the power in which i can do that and then like logically reflecting rejecting the idea of religion so yeah that's kind of what the song's about oh man i really hear you uh, bob's probably thinking these bonkers levantines <laughs> <laughs> you know, british bob but uh, yeah. but uh, um you know i i totally hear you to this very day i if i you know when you walking behind someone and you catch their heel with your oh, toe right, yeah, I, yeah. We ha- I have you have to uh, grab you um that person's little finger oh Other- is that right otherwise oh, the that's day a good one. will go t- otherwise yeah. it's to take the evil eye off it's a very specific right. thing yes. it's like you right, have right. to do that to take away the evil eye oh my god but, but one of the really thank positive- you for letting me know that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank god i, I let the, you know the, there's so much I've, evil eye i can get rid of I, now like. i've <laughs> saved so many of your future days there yeah, yeah, alex yeah, yeah. and and then there's a real positive thing which i still have and always will have you, you know after my mum's gone um which is uh, uh it, it, whenever something bad happens from you know drop from breaking a glass to someone pranging the back of my car or something she, my mum would just go you know that's really good because that's taken the evil eye off you ah you know, that's you, good you were in the, you know because sometimes you're in the zone you haven't had an accident for a while you haven't yeah. you know something bad hasn't happened for a while she's always really happy when something bad happens as long as you're not hurt yes yeah yeah it, it's, so, it's kind of like, it's like the valve for the yeah. release of the evil yeah or if I you know, I broke I, I broke my wrist she goes oh, you know you, you could have it could have been much worse now you you know it's taken the evil eye off you you're not gonna break your back now you know she's she'll always look at it like positively that's, that's good. good I like that I like that <laughs> so uh, pressing on, and we are nearing the end here. We we are at uh, Love Illumination, um, which is a, a, another. You always have good titles. Um, what do you want us to think of, uh, Las Vegas or Blackpool here? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I, I I I guess with with that we were kind of like 
singing about like kind of oh, I, I don't know like uh, how well one thing we were singing about was there the, the were some sort of like um Illuminati kind of references as well. I guess that's what the illumination was that we were re referring to in the song, and kind of like and cults. And we were talking about the idea of cults and uh, how absurd they are, and and how the idea of these kind of like organizations and the Illuminati are often absurd, but so appealing to people and like like and and, and how crazy it can be. And I remember when we made the video we did put some illuminati type imagery in kind of taking the piss and then as soon as it went up on youtube there were all these comments from these conspiracy theorists that's kind of like look <laughs> these guys are illuminati like how do you think they got successful it's because they're illuminati it's like no 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 we're taking the piss ah, ah. you're saying that because you are illuminati yeah, yeah, right? you're right. Say. Yes, yeah yeah exactly. look, look there's a guy wearing a lizard's head in the video <laughs> they're lizards you know? <laughs> they're lizard people yeah, yeah, yeah. with funny handshakes yeah yes oh christ um so so again pressing on now we have so we're we're now at uh, standing stand on the horizon and yeah. And I'm thinking again, so many singles from every album. You're a label, you're a record label's dream because, <laughs> you know, almost every label is just like, guys, come on, yeah. write me another single. You've only got one single on this record, whereas you've always haven't had an embarrassment of riches. It's funny, isn't it? Because, like, I, I love singles, like, 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 and I've always loved singles, and I really loved them as a kid as well. And the first records I had were singles. I remember I, I used to have one of those little dancette things that I, I inherited from an uncle or something, and you used to be able to stack the singles up on it. And yes. so that was that was my first way of listening to music. And it's funny because today there is such a a warmth felt towards vinyl, and like there's a real love of vinyl. And but it's specifically towards the LP format, and. I feel for me the single and and is is maybe stronger for for me than the 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 LP record. Like I love the idea of like this self-contained song that just exists completely in its own right. And so yeah, I I, I love the idea of singles, and I love the idea that they're all here together on one record as well. Yeah, that's, that's that's cool. It makes total sense because you know your your arrangements are always almost always really tight, and you seldom go stray beyond the three minute. Mark. Yeah, you know, I, it, it, it's funny. That that's something that came to me later as a songwriter, like like the the bravery to be brutal to your own music. Because I think often when you first start writing songs, this is true for a lot of songwriters. They they kind of feel like, wow, I made this. I'm a genius. <laughs> you know, like, like I'm gonna put all of our, everything I do is genius. It's so good. These are my babies. I made them. You know, like, <laughs> and often that will stay with songwriters. And for me, one of the most revolutionary moments was realizing that, kind of like, maybe everything isn't genius. And there's nothing more satisfying than after having written something to like take the scalpel to it and cut out all the bits that are boring and make something that's like precise and to the point and really brutal and I, I love that and that's what a, a good single is to me something that gets in there waxy about the face and it gets out again yeah well there's maturity there because that and that well, that works with production too it's not just yes, like definitely you know, what can i mute rather than yes. and also you know what can i take out of, yes. of an arrangement well you see that's why i always loved in dance music as well because like, i always felt that like Dance music producers were much more drawn towards minimalism than rock producers. Like, like so many rock producers, like all oh, band producers, wanted to layer and layer and layer. Yet within the dance music world, it was all about like kind of a single kick drum sounded so much more powerful than a hundred layers. You know, and that really, really appealed to me. And that's perfect that you say that because we're at the point in your life now where. You're just about to go into studio with lovely Philippe Zadar. Ah, the amazing Philippe, yes. yes. And so again, let's take stock. Where were you at now uh, as we approach uh, album five? So album five, um, we had, we'd, we'd popped away for a while to make a record with Sparks and we toured that. Nick had a, a young family at that time and kind of felt, oh, I can't tour anymore. So he left the band. And for us, that was a bit of a shocker. 
and a, a, you know a big moment for us and we started writing again together asked ourselves the question like are you still excited about this and yes and do you feel excited about this new music yeah and so we started writing but and Julian came to join us but I remember when we first met Philippe and Philippe came over to join us in Scotland and his excitement I mean you must have known Philippe you must have met Philippe a few times before have lots of friends in common right okay like Philippe was like a a huge presence like a, a, a big personality and a larger than life character to have in the room I remember when he first came in the room and we were playing the songs like his enthusiasm for them was astonishing you know like, like he was so excited like we've got to record them now they sound so good and yeah that that really gave us the confidence that we needed at that time to sort of kind of go like ah oh, yes no this is good this this does feel good and also to be in the room with someone like Philippe who we did admire and like like I, I, I loved Cassius and the way he makes record sounds was, was was great and it was an amazing time making that record wasn't it Bob it's maybe my favorite uh, studio ex time yeah we, we did we did three weeks in Rack in London which was the bait all the basic tracking and it was just absolutely brilliant the energy was just up there constantly it was just I, I was every morning i was waking up excited you know like walking into the studio just yeah. like couldn't wait to get there you know it was oh, that's, brilliant that's really, really, really great yeah. that's good to hear because he sounds you know on paper the perfect producer for you because you, yeah. there was yeah. always a, a, you know obviously you're scottish well almost like scottish and but there was a gallic flair about you which <laughs> which which was kind of supported by the fact that Daft Punk fell in love with you so yeah, early, yeah, yeah. you know, and also your, your, you know, you, you wanting to have just having these dance and club sensibilities about you. Yes, uh, yeah. It, it made perfect sense. To, it, and it, also, he's an outsider. Th that you get the sense that Philippe could have been much bigger, like a Daft yeah. Punk, but where, whereas Cassius operated much more on the fringes and and was so influential <laughs> yeah i think it, that's definitely true actually yeah, yeah. so but when, when, we, when we were trying to when we were we made a list of producers like you know who would we want to work with this record and philippe was right at the top and uh so our label and, man and manager were trying to get in touch with him to see if he was any availability because couldn't couldn't get hold of him at all and our manager was like oh you know is this elusive kind of character he's no an one enigma. knows yeah. no one yeah. knows where he is he could be in ibiza he could be in paris he could be in la it's just impossible to get hold of him and i was like i said well, you got his number and it's like and it's like actually yeah just texting him <laughs> <laughs> really? text, like, do you want to make a record for and it's like oh yeah that'd be great send me yeah. some songs i'm just picking up my daughter from school but yeah it sounds great <laughs> brilliant brilliant all humans yeah. Yeah. oh wonderful so so always ascending Yes, is, is 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 where we're at, and and um, well, I mean, we just talked about generally about you know your 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 working with Philippe. So how how was how did that record go for you together as this production unit? It 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 was, you know, what I loved about that record as well was how even though Philippe's coming from that dance music background he loved like the live performance and we were talking about you know as often as the case when you work with a producer you talk about the records that you love and i remember like um uh, we were listening to the first b52's record and like like and he said oh, that, when i was a like, boy this is the record that like made me want to make records you know and, and I, i've always loved that record as well it's been really inspiring. and we really bonded over listening to that one and he was saying like you know what makes this record good is like listen to the tempo and like he's totally got that dj's ear for tempo and kind of like listen to how slow it is here and then it speeds up because they're excited you know and and we talked about this th this idea of playing live as a band and that's always been important for us as a studio and I uh, as a band rather and I loved how he embraced that and it wasn't just about kind of like looping something and sampling it's like, kind of like yes use that technology and bring it in but at the core of it have a band playing live together and have that sort of like dirtiness and, mm. and uh, what if it, uh, also a rule that he would have would be no sounds appearing that that outnumbered the amount of musicians on stage that could be yes. making them so you know ha! not, not yeah. having like you know not playing live requiring layers and layers of track and stuff everything on the record had to be edited down so it could be made by the individuals on stage so that you could yeah so it's it. like, yeah. like how many yeah. hands do you have in the band like could all of the hands in the band be Make making things. what we are hearing yeah. And, and yeah and again i think that comes from that dance floor minimalism you know which which he really had like you do listen to those cassius records and they sound so big and they're so powerful 
but there aren't a lot of elements in them. You know, there's a simplicity and a directness about them, which is kind of what makes them so strong. Yeah, you've got space. Like the, yes, that, definitely. That, that bass line is huge because it's got yes, the space to exactly. be huge. Yes, exactly. No, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not going to get into side chain, but it's too, it's too, it's too, uh, it's too <laughs> spotty. It's too spotty yeah. um, for Virgin Radio. So um, I know what you mean. Exactly. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. Um, so we're at uh, we're at glimpse of love now 18, 18 of 20 uh, and did you really get all your lyrics from from uh, like head newspaper headlines or picture captions or it's, something it's like a that it's sidebar you know like on certain do we even give them the benefit of no, naming them just, no we don't like there, there are disgusting tabloid yeah, yeah. There, there are certain tabloid websites that you have that that have this very predatory nature to them as well like like the and it's of celebrities but specifically women and younger women and again quite vulnerable people and the way that they are objectified and spoken about is is kind of appalling and we took a lot of the lines that were the the headlines in this uh and those kind of sidebars you have on these websites took them out of context and put them into the song and like when you listen to the lyric initially it sounds like something it could be kind of romantic or it's like yearning for some sort of love and then when you listen to it like as you the more you listen to it like, you realize it's quite sinister and it really feels like it's written from the perspective of some kind of psychotic stalker and that's what it is really because that's what yeah these characters are the way that the way that they write and the way that they do stalk these these people it, it, it really is like that but to write that song again um within the history of the band we've always like tried to sort of write things from different contexts and try and write in ways that we haven't before so i guess making that record we were trying to do that a lot of the record songs on that record were using techniques that we haven't had before and so I guess that using that technique was something that we hadn't done before in a in a song like using text from an environment that was totally different from our lived experience I suppose. Well, how lovely that you got to work with Philippe and to be to be one of the last things that he did before uh, you know his his tragic demise. That must have been a yeah. terrible thing for you to go through. Yeah, it was. It was. It was uh, uh, a, a terrible show. That, to, to be honest, I, I haven't really completely comprehended. You know, like I, I don't think you really do, do you? You know, it's because um, I, I, I spend quite a bit of time in in Paris these days, and w whenever I sort of see something or somebody, I, you, I still have the instinct. Oh, I should tell. No, I should tell him about. No, he's not not there. You know. It's, yeah, uh, I keep them all in my phone book. Uh, yes, yes. I love, I because it, it, you know, it, they're, they're st it's like they're still there. Yes, you know, every yeah, single yeah. one that's gone. Yeah, I've yeah, still yeah. Got, I've still got them always. It, 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 it's, it. it's 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 funny, like like um, I, I've found myself going back and looking at texts as well, like like just text exchanges, and then kind of because uh, that feels very alive because it's 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 not a a rose tinted memory it's like it's it's an it's a real memory of like what your conversations actually were yeah and and like 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 and um it, it could be quite brutal seeing it knowing that it's it's not going to come back as a continuation you know it's uh but yeah you can't delete them can you um well you can but i don't no <laughs> So we we come to the here and now. Yeah. Now. So again, let's take stock. <laughs> let's 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 look at the here and now. How are you? I, I'm I'm really good actually. I'm really really good. What about you, Bob? Yeah, I'm, I'm very well, thanks. Yeah. yeah? All good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you're smiling away, yeah, like, yeah. And, you're, and and now sort of looking back at this incredible body of work and 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 a way more than your fair share number of hooks. <laughs> uh, you know, the muse has visited you. A lot, yeah. Uh, musically, lyrically, the whole thing. You know how, with the benefit of hindsight, now looking back across this astonishing back catalogue, it, it, it's you know it's funny because most artists don't like looking back. You know, you want to be looking forward, and your favourite song is the new song, etc. Yes. Uh, but it is actually really healthy to look back occasionally, and to like sort of like, like, all right, how did I get here? And for me, it, making this record, the, the Hits to the Head record, it was the first time I really did listen to all of these songs together and to see the kind of progression that you made right from the beginning when we first started getting it together to now and where we are. And I, I, 
I did enjoy it. You know, I, I, I did enjoy like seeing it. It's kind of like, oh yeah, that's what we've stuck into the world. That's 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 pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's all right. Yeah, yeah. and you know, yeah. here's here's the proof. Yeah, here's yeah, the yeah, proof. No, no, it, it, and it felt nice. Yeah. And then and then and so now you've got we come to to number nineteen. This is curious. And so we've got the it's the obligatory new song for for the <laughs> greatest hits album. In fact, it's it, there's two. And that is is that a thing? Uh, the last people that I did with this with it was real heroes of mine. Tears for fears. Oh, and right. on their last greatest hits album, they had two new songs. Oh, one of which has gone oh, on we to their done three new. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Or well, one of them, which has gone on their uh, on their new album, so um, so curious. Uh, t- yeah, tell me. So, w- where are you at with this? Well, um, I, I guess that song was written during lockdown, um, and it's the first song that we did with Audrey mm-hmm. as a new drummer. Um, again, Paul during lockdown. He had some issues to deal with, with his mental health, and uh, decided he couldn't tour anymore. And Paul's our best friend, you know, like like he was my friend for like eight years before we had a band together or anything like that. And so you look out for your best friends, and if he says he can't do that anymore, even though it was a shock to us and not something we were expecting, uh, but yeah, you support your pals and say, right, that's right. And so it was a strange moment where you felt shock and sympathy, yet loss. But also it became very exciting when you first played with Audrey as well. You know, she's she's incredible drummer and an incredible person as well. And, you know, earlier we were talking about in- instincts and like how you feel instinctively in a situation. And when you're in a room and playing with somebody and just your instincts are going crazy because it feels good. And that's really how it felt when we played with Audrey for the first time, playing this song. Where'd you find her? Uh, she, she's been in, sort of in the Glasgow scene for years uh, and been in various bands. Um, I, I, Hector Berserk was a band she was in, I don't know if, if you're familiar with them. And Julian uh, had played, I knew her from the scene basically, yeah. I'd seen her play. And Dino, had, see, had his old band had played with her band at some point. And he commented to his pals at the time, or to his bandmates, saying, "You know, if I was ever in a different band, I'd want her to be the drummer because she's ab- she's, she's incredible to watch." So yeah, we we, we 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 were in the rehearsal room and we were chatting about, "Well, we need to get a drummer," and her name came up. And, and well, the conversation we had was, "Well, where are we going to get a drummer from?" And like Dino and Julian joined the band, so they have to come from Glasgow. And so the, the conversation, right, who's the best drummer in Glasgow? And, and, and like, it was like, well, Audrey is. So like, yeah. we said, well, let's give her a call. And, and we literally called her up and sort of said, what are you up to this afternoon? She's like, oh, I've got work on. Uh, I can come down at six though. And she literally came down at six and yeah, it felt great. And Hit, hit um, that slushy yeah, high hat yeah, hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was good. And, and she, yeah, she had the groove, you know, that was brilliant. It. Well, yeah, that's yeah, all yeah. you need. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good to hear. Yeah. Um, and so, and which brings us to the, we're at the last song, um, Billy Goodbye. Uh, I heard a touch of a yellow. Ah, it's just, just a touch of that funny. thing. Yes, that thing is. that Jeff Lynn does yeah. when he affects the vocal. What is he? He just flanges a vocal or something. It's it's a very ELO thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so that came about. Like, so we, we were working on this song with Stuart Price. And, oh, and, I know Stuart. Uh, He's yeah, lovely. Yeah, amazing. Like, like so much fun to work about on, on with him. And we were talking about what the song was about. And what I loved with him about uh, as a producer. He he kind of like spoke the way that really sort of like spoke to me. Like he wanted to speak about the meaning of the song and what you were trying to communicate more than the specifics about the sounds or the type of microphone you were using or anything like that. Yeah. It was like what what are you conveying here? And so we talked about the meaning of the song and what was about by like kind of looking back on friendships and like seeing what was good about them even though they might be over. And then I was saying about like how with the song I was trying to like. So like have the the past and the present and the future existing simultaneously within the context of the song. And I said, and how I was saying to him, like, I wanted that to be there in the sound of the song as well, and the way that we recorded it and the way we were produced and mixed it. And so there would be things that you felt could have been, well, for me, like from nineteen seventy two, the year I was born, to uh 
2002 the year that we formed to 2022 like which then was the future because we finished it in 2021 and um and and he was like, oh yeah i love that idea and so when <laughs> when we come to the bit where i sing uh there's a line where i sing like walk into the future and uh it's kind of like a joke of like so sort of like stepping into the future and we were like trying to think like okay like let's go back to the time of say elo retro future and what would what would the how would you have imagined what the future would sound like then and of course it was like like that vocoder phased sort of a sound so it was a, a, a kind of like a bit of a sonic joke to kind of have at that point in and the song he's very cheeky with those little yeah he you know, is. That's, he's, what, he's, that's a stuart thing isn't it yes he's very good but then like kind of like without getting too geeky there are other kind of like sonic elements that you could only have had in 2022 you know yes. like, like like certain way the drums would sound or, or are treated and some of the kind of like popping sort of sounds you wouldn't have heard in 2002 or 2020 never mind 1972 well you nailed it and he nailed it and and actually no word of a lie hand on heart i can say that you've ended with a song that stands up to any song before it ah, which is a good. Yeah. which is a kind of a nice place to be yeah because yeah. I, I guess that's what we were aiming for with the record because like you know that as i was saying the whole point of like looking to the past was to take us to the present and then walk into the future as well and i i, I feel at, at, at this moment in my life like quite happy to say goodbye to the past and and look forward to the future and it's, it's been a, a, a good experience doing that yeah well i i well with that in mind Again, hand on heart. I'm not your A and R or your manager, but if I <laughs> but if I were, I I would say it's very clear to me that you need to make an album with Stuart. Oh, right? Yes, he, he's. I mean, I, it's I, a no brainer. I I I, I think right? yeah. Again, a, a little bit like Philippe as well. Like like Stuart kind of like like understands both worlds. Yes. You know, like, it's, it's funny over the course of this conversation we've had, like so much of it has been like talking about going between the dance world and the rock and roll world, and. And so the characters that we've been drawn to and what we've wanted to do ourselves is kind of all about that. And yeah, I think Stuart really is one of those guys who understands and lives in both of those worlds too. Absolutely, that's what I love about him and about you as well. And, and, how, and how nice that, you know, you, you do your last thing with, with Philippe Zadar and then the, the, you know, the archetypal Frenchman and then, and then you do, well, and then you go on to the faux Frenchman. Yes, to, I know. To, to Monsieur Le Jacques Lacan. Yeah, you know, the, the, the best thing out of Reading since the M4, as I always say. Well, as, as I've always said, <laughs> since really 19... Good. I gave him, I gave him his line. first television... I did his first television ever thing on M, when I was on MTV. And I called him the, the best thing out of Reading since the M4. No then. way. He, Has that been his tagline ever since? Well, no, <laughs> he, he, the thing is, he takes himself very seriously, as you know. So, yeah, you know, yeah, I, think yeah. he, he was, he was, I think he maybe misunderstood my, my levity a little bit. <laughs> right. I, I did hear an amazing story about Stuart. I don't know if it's true, but apparently he used to do, because he was like doing the full French thing, apparently his first interviews he would do with a translator. Yes. Like he would do them over the phone and pretend. Yeah, that was his le That's record label so boss, good. Mark Jones, I think, making him do that. Yeah, That's so to, good. Like, I, I, yeah, I, I, I love that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so maybe? Are we saying may maybe to that album with Stuart? I, I, mean, I, would, I, I, I loved working with him. Like, it was great. And I'd very happily do something with him again. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. All right, boys. I've, kept, I've taken so much of your time. Um, thank you so much. My Thanks. God, no, that's, the longest, yeah. that's the longest one of these ever. All right. Okay, Can we right. make this a podcast? Do the whole thing? Because that's, <laughs> that, that's an hour. This is an hour long special, which we'll obviously cherry pick. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah but yeah. like, yeah, let's please. Can we just do the whole thing as a podcast? All right. That'd be, well, amazing. That'd be amazing. And um, yeah, good luck to whoever, whoever has to edit it. To well, get if, it you, if you've made it this far, I well mean, done. It's, 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 an, it's a, what do they call it? It's, a, it's an album companion. You know, yeah, you, you could, yeah, you could, yeah, you could yeah. listen to the album and then play the individual, you know, you guys yeah. are waxing oh, you, you about should, each track. You, you should do it so you have like the album playing in one, one, one speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, my, the podcast and the other my ADHD brain yeah. that would work fine uh, gentlemen absolute joy to talk yeah, no, to no it's you. been amazing thank you, thank you. yeah cheers